Thank you very much, uh, Jacob and Alan also, and the Alpine Fellowship for hosting this event and for inviting me to be part of it. Can you hear me well at the back? Yeah, okay. So this is going to be uh, some reflections on freedom and ethics from a secular Buddhist perspective. But let's start with um, a very brief citation. Uh, this comes from probably one of the earliest Buddhist texts, perhaps going back as far as the fifth century BC, we don't quite know. It's possibly old because it involves um, a metaphor, a parable, texts which tend to precede the more analytical discourses that we find that evolve later in all spiritual, philosophic, religious traditions. So this is the Buddha speaking. Just as in the great ocean, there is but one taste, the taste of salt, so in this dharma and training, there is but one taste, the taste of freedom. Now, I've already used um, a jargon term, dharma, which I'm not even going to try and translate. Um, you could go for something like law or lawfulness or maybe something like fundamental principles, but it also means discourse, teaching, uh, explanation. When the Buddha attained what Buddhists call his enlightenment or his awakening, we have some quite, again, early texts coming from the Pali language um, in which we get some hints, at least, as to what it means to wake up. Well, there you go, you see. <laughs> so um, when, when, when the Buddha speaks of what it means to wake up, nothing, um, he talks of it as being awakening or an understanding of what he calls the Dharma. So this is what he says about the Dharma. The da this Dharma I have reached is deep, hard to see, difficult to awaken to, quiet and excellent, not confined to thought, subtle, sensed by the wise, not sensed by the Buddhists, but sensed by the wise. And we have another passage, which again is of comparable antiquity. This Dharma is clearly visible, immediate, inviting, effective, and again, sensed by the wise, felt by the wise. Now, there seems to be a paradox here, because we have, on the one hand, his calling the Dharma hard to see, and then in the next citation, he calls it clearly visible. So it's clearly visible, but hard to see. In the Zen tradition, they have an image of a fish who spends its life swimming through the ocean looking for water. So this Dharma, and we might almost say this freedom, uh, is something that is intimately close to us but very difficult to see. It's right before our eyes, but we don't see it. And this suggests, I think, that the kind of freedom that is the taste of this dharma is somewhat like the ocean of life in which we swim. We don't see it, or very rarely, occasionally, sometimes very vividly. And this dharma is understood, again going back to the Buddha's awakening, in two ways. On the one way, on the one hand, Dharma refers to the actual conditionality of life itself, which is most succinctly defined in the phrase, if this is, that 
arises. If this is not, that does not arise. A recognition of how our lives, maybe life, the world, reality if you wish, uh, is something fundamentally conditional. And that implies that it's always on the move, it's always changing, it's impermanent, it's transient, it's contingent, it's impersonal, it has no, nothing much to do with, with me. It's simply what happens in my body, my heartbeat, my inner organs working away. These things are not me, although I lay some kind of slightly spurious claim to them by saying they're mine. But essentially, this dharma of conditionality is describing the, uh, the, 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 the fact that life is always in motion, it's always moving on, and it's doing so not in a chaotic way, but in a lawful way. Again, suggested by this idea of dharma as law. We might call it the natural law of cause and effect, for example. And yet we kind of resist this sense of the world. We don't want things to be changing. Or at least we don't want things we don't like uh, to be not changing. We want to sort of hold ourselves in place to get a sense of, uh, of, of, of solidity, uh, of where our boundaries clearly lie, of who we are, what my status is in society and so on. And in some ways in doing that, although it's an entirely natural and understandable thing, we also pull back from the freedom that is open to us, that is implicit for us, and prefer instead something secure, something we feel we know, something we can somehow remain tied to. Whereas, again, quoting an early Buddhist source, to see conditionality, says the Buddha, is to see the Dharma. And to see the Dharma is to see conditionality. It's as though this process describes an inherent dynamic structure of life itself. In some of the later Buddhist texts, they talk of this as a, a natural freedom, a natural nirvana that allows life to emerge, flourish, and eventually to disappear. And in a larger scale, we can see it as the law that undergirds evolution by natural selection. We see it as what we would call the process of history, histories of societies. Our own personal story is, again, understood as a sequence of conditions, of causes and effects that have brought us to the moment where we are now. So the, the freedom that's spoken of here is not a personal freedom, but it's something about the very structure of the world that is vital, that is unfolding, that is being born, that is dying endlessly. There's something liberative in the fact that that happens at all rather than does not happen. The personal sense of freedom is more to be found in the notion of nirvana. So just to go back a bit, when the Buddha sketched what it means to have woken up, it's to have woken up to the conditionality, the freedom of conditionality, and it's to have woken up to the freedom of nirvana. Now again, I suspect many of you have heard this word nirvana many, many times. Please put out of your mind all that you have uh, heard about it. Nirvana is not something exotic. It's not some kind of Buddhist paradise or state of complete transcendence. But it is simply defined as the freedom from greed, the freedom from hatred, the freedom from fear, the freedom from confusion, opinionatedness. In other words, it's describing a non-reactive space of consciousness, of mind, which allows us the freedom to respond to life situations uh, without our reactive 
habits and fears and attachments getting in the way. Nirvana is basically um, the absence of something. And it's not an absence that we achieve after many, many lifetimes of deep meditation, but rather it's uh, an absence, it's a freedom that is already here and now. It's immediate, it's akaliko, it's timeless in the sense that it's, it doesn't require a sequence of temporal steps to get to it. It's a potential, it's a possibility that is present to all of us, to all beings, right now. So we all know nirvanic moments. Whenever our minds, our thoughts, our, uh, our, our, our anxieties just calm down a bit. And we all know what it's like to feel that ease, that openness, that calm, which is not passivity, a sort of dullness, but going back to a term that John used, uh, it's, it's a kind of spontaneity. It's a vitality. Um, from, from this perspective, we fail to live to our optimum capacity because we're too tied into certain opinions and ideas and fears and attachments, some of which are generated by our social conditioning, our upbringing, our, our po political systems, but also, and this is where Buddhism probably has the most to say, on our psychological conditioning, uh, our, our patterns of behavior in which we get stuck. So the freedom of nirvana is the space that opens up that then allows qualities such as generosity, love, wisdom, tolerance uh, to come forth. And this is a path. This is a path that um, we walk in each moment of our lives, no matter what we're doing. And Nibbana is that space that is an absence of what prevents us from moving freely, from responding freely, from reaching out with a generosity that feels quite natural, but we're held back. You know, can I really do that? What's that other person going to say? We have these hesitations, these anxieties, these embarrassments that, that hold us back from, from engaging with the world. In traditional Buddhist language, they call these hindrances obstacles. And a hindrance is basically a blockage on a path. It's, we're walking along quite happily, everything's going fine, we're in our flow, we're in our rhythm, and then suddenly, bang, we hit up to the psychic equivalent of a fallen tree, and we stop in our tracks, and we go then into a kind of internal spinning around in our minds, getting preoccupied with anxieties which embed themselves in our body and keep us completely stuck. So the Buddha speaks of a middle way, a middle way that integrates the natural freedom of the conditioned world itself, conditionality, together with the the moral or the ethical freedom that is opened up when our minds are no longer trapped in our fears, attachments, desires, and so on, which for lack of a better term, I would call reactivity or reactive patterns. Remember, though, that the Dharma is not just um, a teaching or a principle, but it is also training. And going back to our first quote, where the Buddha says, this, uh, 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 this Dharma, uh, sorry, this Dharma that he's found is not just a principle, but it's also a vinya, the Dharma vinya, the Dharma and the training. In other words, this is something that we can do. And this training, is what leads us, I think, more deeply into what 
we might describe as the taste of freedom. I think the first time in my own practice of Buddhism that I found a taste of this freedom rather than all sorts of theories about it was when I first did a 10-day Vipassana retreat with uh, Satya Narayan Goenka back in 1974. I was already, I'd just been ordained as a Tibetan Buddhist monk, and for some reason that I still don't understand, the Dalai Lama invited Goenka to lead a 10-day retreat for uh, the younger monks and Westerners staying in Dharamsala at that time. And that uh, practice is one we don't find in the Tibetan traditions. But that 10-day retreat that I did then uh, opened up what Dharma meant in ways that I had not, till that point, ever really understood. In other words, it made these concepts and these ideas about impermanence and suffering and selflessness, not just concepts, but became in embodied experiences that were felt. But we must be careful, I think, to reduce Buddhist practice just to becoming proficient in certain meditative skills. Um, I feel that the Dharma is really about becoming what Peter Sloterdijk, the German philosopher, has called a practicing human a practicing human. It's our humanity that becomes our practice, not just particular skills such as those of meditation. In the Buddha's first discourse, um, we find him describing what are essentially the core elements of this training, of this discipline. And again, there's a tension between the spontaneity of Nibbana that may be already there, but also the requirement to actually train our minds in such a way that we become more, more skilled, more focused, more present, more attuned uh, to, the, to the demands of each moment in which we're seeking to live as fully as we can. And this awakening, uh, this way of life, entails recognizing, performing, and mastering four interrelated tasks. The first task is to embrace life, to open one's heart and mind to the immediacy of the moment in which we find ourselves, both intimately within ourselves, within our immediate friendships, and of course, extending to the world, the planet that we live in and with others. That needs, too, to be embraced, to be able to say fundamentally, yes, this is my life now. This is the moment. This may be my last moment. How can I be fully and totally a part of that? So embracing life and then letting go, the second task, of our reactive habits. Now, of course, we can't just say to a reactive habit, like, say, a compulsive anger, go away. It won't have any effect at all, I'm afraid. In fact, it might make it worse. So letting go, I think, is really better understood as letting something be. This is close to Heidegger's Gelassenheit letting things be, instead of being driven by our compulsions, our fears, to simply see them for what they are, the arising of patterns within the mind that if we leave them alone, they will fade away by themselves. That's their nature, to change and to disappear. There's no need to fuel that further by our anxieties or our fears, our desires but letting that stuff just be. That is, I think, very much at the heart of this sense of freedom. The third task is to recognize those moments when reactive patterns are not happening. 
And that might be for much of our day. We have good days, we have bad days. I do, at least. But we don't necessarily valorize sufficiently those moments when we are in that kind of open acceptance, awareness, stillness, gelassenheit. So to consciously valorize, and again, the word taste comes to mind, to feel, to taste this kind of stillness, openness, and possibility, to get to feel it in our bones, in our inner organs almost, not just as an idea. And it's that stopping, those moments in which this reactivity is not active, that is nirvana, that is nirvana, those moments. There's a Thai Buddhist monk of the last century called Ajahn Buddhadasa who wrote a little essay called Nirvana for Everyone, trying to get it off its pedestal and back into a recognition that this is just a human reality. It's sensed by the wise. It's not sensed by the people who belong to the right religious group. And it's from that space of non-reactivity that the fourth task, that of cultivating the path, cultivating a middle way, becomes possible. It gives us the freedom to embark on another kind of life. So this freedom, uh, this kind of freedom, as, as sketched, albeit very briefly here, in this way, ag again brings us back to Isaiah Berlin's idea of negative freedom and positive freedom. Letting go of reactivity or letting it be is negative freedom. It's, free, it's, it's, it's a seeing how we're not uh, driven or tied or obliged to feel or think or act in a certain way. We're free to do otherwise. And cultivating a path, developing and following a very specific way of life in the world is our positive freedom. So here we get both. And I feel that this uh, perspective is one that valorizes both forms of freedom equally both to free ourselves from those things that impede us and to cultivate and develop those qualities that enable us to flourish as persons, to flourish as communities, uh, to flourish as a society, as a global society. So nirvana, therefore, is not the goal or the end of the path at all. Nirvana is the starting point. Nirvana is the origin, this absence of reactivity, is the very spring from which a way of life, another way of life, not the habitual neurotic one, is able to come forth. Nirvana is the hinge of the path, the point on which it turns, not the end point, but the, but the, the turning point point of the path, an idea I've taken from Taoism, actually, from Shuangzi. And this suggests very much that Nibbana is a free ethical space. It's the space from which one seeks to live in the world and respond to its challenges with care. The Buddha's final words were, Things fall apart, tread the path with care. It's a bit of Yeats and a bit of Heidegger in the translation, but I feel this captures it quite well. Tread the path with care. And in English, we have the happy accident that we care in the sense of care for something, but we also care in the sense of being careful, of being attentive of being mindful. It's both. And such a non-reactive space is a gateway to this path, which I've already equated with the famous middle way, but perhaps more importantly to what 
the Buddha presents as an eightfold path. In other words, the path is not just a spiritual path. That's only one bit of it. But to be a practicing human involves that our path in life involves our vision, our imagination, our speech, our work, everything becomes part of the path. Uh, the whole of those, all of those qualities are to be brought into being, to be cultivated, uh, not just meditation. And it's, this is an ethical path in the sense that it is a way of framing um, how we seek to become the sort of person we aspire to be. It's not about ethics in terms simply of following Buddhist morality or morality of any other kind, but it's about uh, becoming fully human according to the specific potentials of your existence. Now, it's here, I think, that we can begin to see how Hannah Arendt may have looked upon Buddhism had she known much about it. I think her sense would be that Buddhism is too much concerned with inner freedom, uh, freedom of the mind, uh, freedom of consciousness, uh, doing practices like meditation that are very much uh, subjective. And what I have found very moving about the little I have read by Hannah Arendt is that freedom needs to be understood as located not within us, but in between us, um, in the relationships that we have with other human beings. The true freedom entails our ability and willingness and also the possibilities of our societies to engage in human affairs, in politics, uh, having the courage and hopefully the insight and the care so that we can engage in conversations with each other as how to live best in this world on this earth. Buddhism, I think, today finds itself in a very fraught, but I think potentially very creative dialogue with modernity. Not with the West, which I think is an outmoded idea, but with modernity, a global modernity. And I'm gonna end just by referring to a book written by one of our listeners here, Yuval Noah Harari, who um, likewise has studied and trained in this form of Vipassana meditation, I mentioned of Mr. Goenka. And in his, his book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, meditation is the 21st lesson, is that correct? And to me, that's a wonderful, it's almost inconceivable when I look back 50 years ago to a bunch of hippies hanging out in India doing these things, that this you know, is now something, this is a, a, a vision, a value system, a practice that is now extending way beyond the monastery, way beyond Buddhism, and is finding its way into our broader society, as the sales of Yuval Noah Hariri's books show us. I think that's extraordinary. And I hope that um, this will continue, that if it's a value, of course, but that's, let's leave it there. I've spoken more than my allotted 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.